guys, welcome to Talking Cinema with Mike. During this podcast, I discuss with a special guest the power of film. And today, my special guest is production designer Robert Foley. And we will be discussing with him about how production design helps tell a story in a motion picture. So welcome to the podcast, Robert. I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. So, um, what made you want to become a production designer? That just sets and film and starting in theater just came instinctive to me. I mean, it's just, I had all the roles on the front of the stage. I needed to be behind the camera. I, that's just where I live. So that's how I tell my story. That has always been my, my, my method of choice in terms of communicating artistically. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's odd because I was given, I, I actually was given a four year scholarship, talent scholarship for design, wow. but the designers had to also audition because the pool is thin. And if they were paying your salary and your scholarship, they own you. So you had to audition. And I was given it for both and never picked up anything on acting. I just, you know, so that's how I convey my story. That's how I tell my story. Uh, you're like a behind the scenes kind of guy. I am, I am. Uh, that's, yeah. That is, I do it through the walls. I do it through, you know, the vision. Um, that's, how I, that's how I talk, yeah. Um, so what kind of movies, like, did you like have any movies that you grew up watching that kind of inspired you to have this profession? <laughs> Yeah, uh, certainly. Um, am I thinking of them right now? No, probably not. But it is, there is stuff that I will just look at and I kind of put the screenplay aside and just look at the visual component and just am overwhelmed. That's what I'll walk away. And they, so they won't necessarily be blockbusters. They'll be just a movie that aesthetically moved me, whether it was the lighting, whether it was the angle, the tact that that particular director took and manifested to the production designer that's fascinates me so watching things move as a film goes on for an hour and a half is is really exciting to me oh um how do you think like a director specifically uses production design for storytelling um i can use good examples i mean wes anderson is known to communicate through color yep lots right. of color lots of color but it's not just like, you know, it isn't a Pollock, you know, he's not just throwing color on a canvas. No offense to the great and late Pollock, but it is it is a very crafted term of, of how they're doing it. Um, and I think, um, I mean, there are others that will really, that just, they, they tell a story. Like I've worked on films where we, if it was a, Scene that took place in Ohio, the color palette was this. If it was the scene in Florida, the light shifted, the color palette shifted. And that was part of moving the story forward of what they were escaping from when they left Ohio and the abuse that was there to this new start. And it was to be reflected in the, in the aesthetic. So there's, there's so many um, ways to do, there's so many ways to do that, you know, um, but they're subtle. They're very, very subtle. Like, um, I would say for like any movie, like if there was a scene where like the characters or if there's something like fun going on, like the, the scene is usually like brightly colored and right. it's like, it feels alive. And But if it's like a more depressing kind of movie, let's say like, like Joker, an instance. Mm-hmm. Gotham City is worn right. down. There's low economy. There's a lot of like homeless people, and there's like trash and graffiti on the streets. Very depressing setting, and that really like sets the tone for the film and like also Arthur's personality throughout most of the movie. Right, and that is how you tell the story in terms of. So it's easy to take for like uh, in music because the guy who's doing the score will take darker tones and diatonic tones to to hit those scenes. We do it in a silent way. And so the lens gets tighter, it gets darker, um, the color palette shifts, you know, y- there's a somberness, but you can really create so much in terms of you'll go to a particular character's home and it reflects them. 
And then you know you're in trouble when you are in another environment and all of a sudden, you know, the light level changes. The, the you know, it just feels darker. It feels uh, 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 sadder. And, and so we communicate that in the things that we choose and how we choose to see it. Um, and again, part of the production designer is how you do not just building it. Sometimes it's what location you choose. So think of it in, in terms of that. So in Batman, it's tough because there's very few lighter scenes. Exactly. It's a dark story. Yep. Uh, and even when he's at a ball or there's some kind of, you know, he's doing the Bruce Wayne thing, there's still an edge. It's doesn't, it's never joyous. It's not raucous, you know, so they never really let go of it. But a production designer will look at how do I create something that's got tension? What does that doorway lead to? How do I make it look ominous and put fear in, you know, natural instinct? You know, you're playing on human reaction, the fight or flight, all of that. So you, you choose angles that are disturbing and colors that are less pleasant. And that, that's how you communicate the feel of it. So you know, look, oh, I'm not supposed to like this space. This is not good. It's when you sit next to someone who goes, out. that's how I want my house done. Then you're in trouble. But, um, you know, it, it, it usually is, it's just, it's, a, it's an aesthetic palette and, and uh, a choice of shapes and images. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any like favorite production designer artists? You know what, I, I don't necessarily, as, as you would think, what I have more than anything are producers or directors whose work I love because with them comes incredible production design. So, you know, David Lynch and, and, and Wes and people like that are really where I gravitate to because I know in their toe behind them is a, a dynamic team of people that I'm going to be wowed by because it's how they mm -hmm. work. Um, it's important to them. There are some that don't care or don't make it the focus. If they're really good, they can still make it work because they know what to say yes to. But people like them, they they start with that. If you read some of the history that goes into the amount of labor years before the project starts of what does this mean and what is that cathartic statement and what's the visual element that we're basing this on? And it'll, that could take a year. That could take a year for them to wrap their head around a talisman, an icon, something that they're like, oh yeah, that tells the story. You know, like it's 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 what you do in plays when you do a cathartic statement of what is the essence of it that everything else is designed off of. And that's how they'll do their production. They'll find some image that speaks to them, that tells the story in just one element. And then they build off of it. It's a pretty fascinating and long process. Yeah, like Wes Anderson's movies, I've I've seen a few of them, like like the Grand Budapest Hotel and like right. the French Dispatch, very right. vibrant colors everywhere. Like, you know, like in Grand Budapest Hotel, like the hotel was it was like post World War II setting. Yeah, before war broke out, everything was like alive and colorful, and everyone was having a good right. time. But the movie ends because you know it was like. The time at the hotel and like all the characters was like a bygone era. Like there right. was by the time World War the World War started, like that hotel was probably reduced to like ruins and forgotten about for many it years. It was either taken over as Hitler often did. He just usurped what he liked. Right. So the crush Lepalski in in Amsterdam, which he thought was beautiful, so he took it for himself. Um, you know, that's so that is what and that that allows it to not get blown up or destroyed. So there's that. But even Grand Budapest Hotel in any any of the blogs or articles you'll read is usually the number one production design movie, like the everyone's first choice. And it's because even though it's all bright, brilliant colors and it's before, the tension of what's about to happen with the war somehow is still communicated. Somehow you know it's looming in the back that their presence is there and even though that color palette is so vibrant, it he managed to communicate what is like, you know, foreshadow what will happen. The fact that they always show the hotel from this bizarre angle of up on that hill, you know, and you see just this parapet wall, they never show it from an accessible entrance. 
you know, they, they always show it in this iconic uh, way that you, that it's a fantasy. You can't actually live there, but in yeah. essence, it's real. Yeah. Or like, um, like, how would you say, like, I've seen, like, with Dave, you mentioned David Lynch, like, how, right. like, could you give me some examples of, like, David Lynch's, like, production design in his movies? Well, if you look at Blue Velvet, for example, and you look at the- That's film, actually my favorite from his. <laughs> I mean, it, yeah, it is, you know, that's the top. And, and then he does, I mean, Twin Peaks on a production level, but it was television, uh, but it wasn't supposed to be television. It was meant to be, uh, what was it? Mulholland Drive was television. I've seen that, that too. But it was meant to be a movie. It was written and produced as a movie, didn't sell. They broke it into hour long segments and made it into the miniseries. Yeah. So, but his, again, with color and, and jarring imagery. Um, so you go two dimensional to three dimensional. And that's part of production design that you'll see. Grand Budapest is very two dimensional. It's not, it doesn't have that depth. It is a cartoonish type of things. There are many films that do that, that, that they're, it's kind of, um, you know, like a fantasy or, or kind of a dreamlike state because they change the dimensionality of it. The, the sharper that is, the more real it is, the more real it is, probably the less pleasant it is. So you have that, you know, frozen illusion you know, that they create, which is what's brilliant about a film like that. Um, all of the phantasmagorical type of time stamp, you know, it looks like the twenties or, but it, you realize it's not a literal example of the twenties. You know, it, it has that industrial steampunk kind of, uh, of fantasy, like the way, you know, uh, uh, 20,000 leagues, or there's always that fantasy part of it. And that's where production design shines. They really get a chance to create an alternative world. So when you look at, look at, I, I consider there's like two major types of production design. There is the pageantry or heraldic, you know, the, the Star Wars or the, the very cast heavy and budget heavy types of things. Um, you know, the Ben Hurs of their time, that, that's noted. These are all things that were larger than life and the production is what made it. Not necessarily the best movie or screenplay at least, but it's the scale of it. And then Big the epic scale movies, like right. like maybe like the Godfather movies or yep. Schindler's List or Titanic. Right, and those are not to break the movies at all, but they are the scale of which they were approached and the money that was behind them shows from the get-go. But but most importantly, like the sci-fis, the Star Wars, which cut, cut a cloth that hadn't been happening. All of that, like the scale of what that took and the amount of animation and CGI and all that kind of stuff, which never existed before. That is, and you go, oh, production design. But then there's the nuanced stuff and it's the Merchant Ivories and it's Tom Ford's A Single Man. And it's, Wait, Merchant it's, Ivory? Wait, isn't that James Ivory? Well, Merchant Ivory is like, a, I guess, a category of like, you know, those type of films. You know, there was an entire series of, and I don't know whether it's the author, but it's a, it's a class of, of period pieces um, that have a certain look to them. You know, and everybody, you know, it's kind of become its own genre. I'm probably not quoting it correctly, but it's kind of its own genre. It's a period piece that is just lush and beautiful. Um, and like, look, like chocolate through water, like that kind of a thing. They're just beautiful to look at. The light, the choice of colors, all of that. And then there's some kind of period, but it's not about the period particularly. It's about the, the level of beauty that they, that they convey. And those are nuanced very subtly because they're not huge casts usually, but something shifts. And that usually is, is telling you the story, whether it's a stormy sky that you choose to shoot, you know, at that time, all of those elements, the way the light changes or the, and therefore the colors, um, all of those moments, those are all production design, very subtle decisions to move the story along that so everybody's following 
the right way and they're not lost. They are like, no, this is going to be sad. Or, you know, they take you where they want you to go, but they do it really without any words. It's just all emotion, which is what's cool about it. Talking Cinema with Mike is brought to you by Nike Shoes. Hey guys, imagine the film about this special sneaker. A movie that takes place inside the shoe store. Just imagine it. A whole blockbuster that takes place within the place where you get the gear you need to run. Start with John Cena and Dwayne Johnson. Directed by mediocre and somewhat acclaimed director Michael Bay. Order your pair today and then see the movie right after. What was like the first project you did like major production design for in your career? Um, yeah, oddly, it was it was more it was on film, but it was a promotional piece for Polygram when they had records and, and their classics and jazz, and we would do the um, I was hired to do the industry reel, so we would create footage, and that footage would take the music videos from classical music and all kinds of, and jazz and all of that, and weave the story in between just to go to the segments we would produce. And there was a theme to that, and then they would go. So I had to create these environments. I was new to it. I fell into it because everybody else, had, like basically they lost their guy and they did it with a lot of trust. And it was um, very interesting because I really had to perform on a dime of, Here's our budget. This is what we have to have. They did not match. Now, I wish I'd known instead of spending, you know, all those hours making giant standing Bose speakers that look like the real thing, that I had done such a great job keeping them under budget that they went out and bought them. Um, you know, that was my comeuppance. I'm, well, I'm pretty good at coming in at budget, under budget. I'm really good that way. Uh, but it's it's how do you convey, like, how do you make this happen? Because people are giving you ideas and words, but they're not necessarily conveying it. I mean, let's face it, our, our people, the directors, they're, they're better at communicating. Um, when I work with just regular clients and we're doing design work, I have to pull it out of them. But it, you have to get inside somebody's head and pull out what they're trying to say. And you could answer with, that's it, you know, once they see it. What kind of movies do you think would be like, would you consider like the hardest to like make for? Most well, challenging. All right. So the most challenging are the least injuries. Uh, documentaries are the most challenging only in as much as you can't change much. You know, there's still somebody has to be putting together what's going on and whether it works. And I need a set for this or I need an environment for that. But it's a documentary. So you can't control a whole lot or things that are documentary driven where you don't you can't change facts. You can't you know, it's it's on the spot. Um, those those get a little difficult at best. You're styling. Um, I did 9-11 um, uh, kids, which was um, 20 years after the event, checking on those students at Booker, who, where the president was that day, uh, 20 years later, who are they, what are they, what's happened to their lives, and a whole other layer to it. There was a message behind the film, but it was a documentary, but I was still on set making sure production worked, making sure that what the eye saw, even though it was a classroom and a legit classroom, you know, that I wasn't, I didn't have copyright things. I didn't have any of that stuff that I'm dealing with, like I'm turning books around or things like that, that would hurt the production. Because, you know, there's all of those copyright infringements of you can't show this, you can't show that without paying for it. Even though you you think you're advertising a product, you are not. You are liable for suit. If you didn't pay for it or work at a deal with them, they'll, they'll cut it out. So that's where you can CGI out a logo on a car or whatever. So those get frustrating because they're, it's very dry. It's very dry. Um, horror is, horror and sci-fi and all that stuff is at one end of the spectrum. But, you know, unless you are really schooled in how to make that work, that's, it's very daunting. I, I've, I've been brought in on those and it's like, you know, I have to do an operating room covered in blood. Like, you know, this is not, 
your run of the first getting an operating room, you know, creating an operating room, getting an operating room, getting the tools, borrowing things, renting things, even things that are accurate or that gets really frustrating. I think that of all locations I've ever had to do on film, getting an OR is the toughest because they never shut down. Um, right. and, you, and the releases. So it was fascinating when Dr. Oz did a television show live at the OR. I'm like, how do you get these people with IV tubes in them signing releases to do this? Because you don't know what's going to come in that door. It's a very difficult location. So as a production designer, those are very frustrating things. Whereas something else that is a stylized piece or a romantic piece, you, it's, you have much more freedom and you get to control things because you get to control the color. You get to control what the fabric or texture or feel is. And it's, it's wonderful. It's like, all right, I'm going to talk silently now. And that's great. So that's a really fun thing to do. And I've had some really great moments. What's not fun is fight scenes that take down walls and cause damage. All right, I've had to do those too. Oh. Cool. Yeah, he's going to put his fist through this. Knock things over and stuff. Yeah. So orchestrating a fight scene and then doing it three times, mm -hmm. uh, not so easy. And we knew that he had to put his hand through the wall. That was in the script. It just had to happen. But we, A, did not own the rental house that we were using, the set house. So I had to create it visually, tighten the lens, and allow him to do it identical to what it was, and then reset it. And in record-breaking time, on low budget, really low budget. So I made, you know, I made fake walls. I dressed them exactly the same. I did it in a way that it was double-sided. I could flip the thing over, like I could get more uses out of it. Because if they didn't get what they wanted, and I only had two surfaces or three surfaces, they're not getting the shot. You know, then it's on me. And if it takes too long, it's on me. So you have to be able to do it, orchestrate it. That's very theater-like, a set change that has to happen in seconds. So you have all of those, not that we're not waiting on you, and you have an entire room of people like staring at your team or you, in that case, you know, making it happen right away. So those part of production sounds very challenging. It has to be, there has to be continuity. It has to look, it has to feel, all of that stuff. Same project. We had it, or we had an orchestrated fight scene. It got out of hand. Things got broken. Walls went down. <laughs> like we weren't done with that room. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, hey, how do we film this? The continuity, like that mirror that was there, is now a gaping hole in the wall. You know, like all of these things that I have to replace, gloss over, hide. You know, those are the things in production design that you don't expect but you have to be prepared for it. That's why theater, what film, a really high budget film is so much money because they've got five of everything. You know, they're waiting for that to happen. If it's a major prop, you better back it up. It, you can't just have one. So if you found your one talisman icon that's incredible and it's an antique and somebody accidentally breaks it, drops it, walks off with it, your whole movie, you've already mm -hmm. shot X amount and now you have to continue. Like, how does that work? So those are the difficulties that are less interesting, but it's, it is, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's all those different departments that fall under production design. There's one vision that works with the director. That's the production designer. Then there's a set designer and then there is a props master. And then there is all of these graphics, all of those different departments in your basic art department that have to create this stuff over and over again, you know? Yeah. Like at the Oscars, like for production, they say production design by and set decoration by. It's always like two or three right. more people. To the because, audience. yeah, I'm sorry, separate. The audience thinks of set design. They think that the set designer, like the, the set, the tech, the walls, the stuff, and that's the set decorator. Um, but the um, production designer is everything that you see visually, what filters through that person. So the set designer is the stuff that you actually think is the floors, the walls, the, the chair they're sitting on, those things which are very important, but it's so much more. It's, it is the graphics that are used, the typeset that is, you know, does it convey the period? Is it accurate? Is it accurate within reason? Did it, are you showing something that didn't exist at the time that the movie was made? You know, things like that. 
that you have to be very cautious about. It may tell the story and be great. It was it, it was invented 20 years later. Like, you know, you can't use it. So you have to make sure you don't make a rookie mistake like that. So the production design is just taking anything that you see on the screen and filtering it through hopefully the same cohesive lens. Uh, what do you think of this year's like production design that came out like in this year's movies? Like, were you impressed by it? I haven't, I'm not, I have to admit that I haven't seen enough to really tell you, you know, um, movies just get better for the most part. And for me, it doesn't have to be a spectacle. It doesn't have to be large for me to get excited about something. Um, I get excited when the emotion on the screen is matching the emotion behind them. Like that, that's what excites me in terms of doing my work. Um, so if I'm telling the story that means, so it's like, it's like having a high, you know, design client and saying, well, this is like, this client has a ton of money. Well, that's great. Money is great. But then you have this client lives in this house with two children and an elderly parent and, you know, emotionally creating the environment that works for them as opposed to just throwing money at it. So I, I find nuanced stuff much more exciting. Yeah. yeah. Like um, the production design that really like wowed me this year with movies was like you know the world of Pandora and Avatar: The Way of Water, which I think is some of the best production right. design I've ever right. seen on Absolutely. film. Absolutely. Or like the nineteen fifties and sixties through um in Elvis, or even yeah. like the fifties and sixties in Steven Spielberg's The Fable. Right. Both of those on that overlapping that same time frame, and beautifully done. Uh, lovingly done. But that is, you know, it's really fun when you have a period like that. Um, I, you know, I've done a bunch of stuff that was 60s driven and, but not in a camp kind of way, but you're trying to evoke what's, what speaks it. Um, yep. And there's so much going on because even though it's a period, there's always sub periods and trends that are also going on simultaneously. So you have to convey all of that. But that is, yeah, this year's been good for those period. I hate to say 60s is period, but it's a period piece for the 50s and 60s for those two. And yep. Avatar only comes along once every 10 years, something like that. You know, that is, it, it blows everyone's mind because it's two-dimensional, three-dimensional. It's, it's stop action. It's all of those things all put together in one. That is a complicated production design. And we'll walk away with it without a doubt. Yeah, like... Like in Elvis, I remember like, as you know, well, here's a pretty example of production design. Like Elvis started out as like a poor kid growing right. up in the South, but the more he got successful, the more colorful and flashy everything around him became. Right. Like the clothes and like the cars and the ha big house and the record deals and right. movie offering. Like, yeah. The colors so were showing, they were expressing his rise to stardom. They were showing him going up in life. I would phrase it as, as his life got lush, his world got lush. This, yeah. this, this, this career career launch, launch, career launch, yeah. Yeah, because it becomes lush because all of a sudden it's like filming in a drought versus, you know, all of a sudden what was dry and arid and barren has now bloomed and it's there's this, this cacophony of color, all of that. That's the, that's the nuance evolution that I love because you get to show a time for your period. Um, it's not that that red car wasn't as red the world it lived in wasn't as brilliant. Yep. Yeah. But then later on, when he started abusing drugs and Colonel Tom mm -hmm. Parker was really like controlling him and his wife left him, everything was getting high and flashy, but then everything got worse and just plummeted down. And then right. you could notice like like the scenery around, you know, Elvis, you know, played by Austin Butler. You can kind of see like his surroundings are kind of getting like darker and losing like the flashy, vibrant color that was he had around him earlier. The chaos of his life was reflected in his environments. Yeah, he was spiraling out of control. So there's too much visual stuff to look at. It, you're making it uncomfortable for them to look. And as his world became more uncomfortable, more stuff, more noise, more things, all of that is how you would communicate that and and just take down the color and or make it just too much to look at and cut you know it makes you uncomfortable and anxious which is 
visually what you're doing as his life is like this, you know, just spiraling. Um, and that's, that's a great, it's so much fun to do it in film. You don't get to do it in television as much. You definitely get to do it in theater. You know, you, you definitely get to do it in theater. It's critical in theater, but in film, you know, only it, it goes with a certain budget and a great director that allows you to speak that way. Yeah. But it's like production design is a way of like, you know, expressing or it, it kind of has like its own voice. Just like mm -hmm. every other technical aspect of a film. Yes, it does. It does. It has a, it speaks volumes too. And it will move you forward. Sometimes it is about a uh, discovery. The person's discovery, an actual um, product or some innovation that is simultaneous to the story, but it sets the time frame and then becomes its own story. And it re gets referred back to over and over again. And that is like a touchstone of the period. So it takes on a whole life of its own. So you make those, you know, Grand Budapest does it with the, with the confectionery. They focus on a confectionery box. And it's because of this wonderful woman that you're falling in love with. And these are her, her, her magical things that she makes. Then you realize it's not just her or you that think so. These are coveted. And then it continues through all the other characters and all the other scenes as an element of desire. And so it has new meaning all over again. Now you've established what it means. Now you put it into application and it continues, even though she doesn't have her hands on it, it continues and it has a message because they taught you what it meant. And so that now is a coveted thing that people are fighting over or wanting. They actually hide things in it at one point in the box is handed very benignly when, you know, to eyes that are watching, thinking it's what it's supposed to be inside, but they've disguised it because it passes on its own. So that's acceptable and that doesn't raise any eyebrows. So you, you take that and you, you take these little elements and then they become new elements that move the story along. It's, it's a beautifully complicated way that the audience doesn't necessarily look at that way, but production design directors do, you know, it, it's, it's all these threads that have to make that fabric. Hey guys, so I was talking to Robert about production design for a war film, and that all of a sudden made me think of the Ukraine. In a war film, there is many death and destruction, and that unfortunately is what is still going on in the Ukraine right now. You can help these people by donating money to donate.amnestyusa.org and putting in the effort to make a difference. Thank you. Well, what else moves you? I mean, you've talked about this year, but um, what else about something that's unexpected that like, like Metropolis, Franzless Metropolis, one of the earliest movies and the earliest horror movie. I right? know, and I still haven't seen that yet. I heard it's terrific. So that is an icon of so many levels. That movie, black and white with subtitles, is considered one of the best films to this day in, for all the things that it did. So if you do see it, watch it, then see the Giorgio Murata version in the, I don't know, late 70s, early 80s, where he took a dance track, he took Donna Summers, he took music of the time and remastered it. So when Metropolis played in a black and white cinema, it played against a live or organist, very melodramatic. And then it kind of grew. I have seen Metropolis in the theater with an orchestra behind it. I have seen the Marauder version, which is just, he's colorized it in moments. It's just this whole, but it is still, Franz Liszt's work on that is still considered number one, the first horror genre ever on film and just magical in terms of what it conveyed. Again, no dialogue, very two dimensional, bad, bad film quality, but yet it still did that. And it set the stage for so much. That is an iconic piece that is worth seeing in it, in all of its in, incarnations. 
because it really in, in, in our highly technical world right now and all the advancements we've made it still holds up like isn't it like isn't metropolis like a foreign film from germany or something yes yep. and it's so wait what's it about it's about like a robot or something it's well you have this image but it's it's a dystopic world basically i'm gonna just i won't even go into much more detail but it's a dystopic world and and just like you know like there's a civilization and there are the drones and there's you see all the layers of it but it is a dark tale of industry and 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 you know progression like with all this innovation the darker side of it you know like it shows people being reduced to factory workers reduced to drones and in you know it's fascinating the way well, that losing their jobs because of the rise of the machines not necessarily that you just you'll feel the emotion and the angst you know the way you do in brazil where there is that one percent in you know brazil is another one that is magically beautiful and i haven't seen that either probably. but we are on such different tracks wait no way brazil i heard brazil i i i do know about terry gilliam i have seen unbelievable brazil. I've seen like I've seen Time Bandits. I've seen the Adventures of Baron Munchausen, but I haven't yeah. seen Brazil okay. yet. Brazil is one of my all-time favorites. So we're hitting on my favorite list now. Brazil, it because it is the reality of what's going on, the harsh reality for the haves and the have-nots, and the very different again, dystopic in its way very different ways in which they are living the same lot the same time frame breathing the same air basically but they're living such different lives and there are people who will never break the cycle of the worker bee that they are no matter how well they're treated or they're told they're treated and so the story really focuses on this kathleen Hel hellman who is the one percent they are living in a world where plastic surgery is coveted and love and beauty is everything, but the world is falling apart. There is mayhem going on. And for everybody else, their lives. So her son refuses to step into the life that he could have. So he refuses. So he is leveled at a certain worker level, desperately trying to fight and claw his way to the top on his own, which is impossible, and goes insane in the process, basically. Um, and then you have a reality check of what was a dream, what was reality, what is fantasy, what is living hell, like what just happened here? And I do remember bringing a friend to see that and all they could say as the soundtrack is playing at the end, at the top of their lungs was what the hell does that have to do with Brazil? That was their comment. And it was just the funniest thing in the world. It's like, okay, we're gonna need to see this a couple of times. Now their favorite movie, but at the time, just horrified, thinking they were seeing a National Geographic version of Brazil. And it is- Well, Robert, so I even know it's not a geographic like episode right. of Brazil. Right, but they were that- well, Why is it called Brazil if it's like a movie about like a dystopian society? Because, well, that's a great question. I mean, if I had to answer it for myself, the going back to the song Brazil, and if you like that type of Portuguese music, which I adore, that song transponds, that tra it transcends, it takes you somewhere. When you are listening to that song, you're, you're whisked off to some beautiful island. It, life just gets better. It's infectious, it stays in your head, and it represents a fantasy world, which plays heavily in the movie. So it can't just be me that feels that way. But it, 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 that's where that person, so, and it, and it is very brutal at the end, and you realize what were they doing for suffering? What, you know, how did they, you know, when you, when you look at people like going through Schindler's and, and all of those stories, how did they make it through? What was the thing that they thought of? What was the song that they sang in their head that made the pain go away? And so all of that plays into that movie, but the way that they did the sets and the lushness and the steampunk to glorify, uh, gorgeous, is just incredible because it is it is fantasy it's reality it's blurred it scares you because it's like oh my god that's so real but that could happen too huh 
you know, they live in this beautiful world where explosions and bombings are going constantly. And they address it when they're in this wonderful restaurant with an, an explosion in the restaurant. Nobody matters. It doesn't, they're so used to it. They scurry around, they clean up, they take a palm tree and a screen and they hide, they hide behind, you know, they hide what just happened and then they move on. You know, so this whole world of like, how could that be? They're all okay with this. How could you, how could I live in a world like that? It's a very fascinating psychological study. That's what that's what Gilliam does. Um, and and the very last scene is mind blowing. So you, you've got homework on those two. Yeah, like another Terry Gilliam movie was I actually watched a couple years back. I'm going to rewatch it soon. It's called Twelve Monkeys. Yes, again one of those other I, on the list. Absolutely. Did he do? Who was June? What? Was who directed June? What's June? Dune. Dune, the sci-fi film. Oh, Dune. No, that was Denis Villeneuve. That was last um, from last year. An original. The one from David Lynch or something? No, I don't think. Is that David Lynch? No, I thought it was. It might be Gillum. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's why you may want to check. It is. Um, it has that same feel. So it is the, you know, um, the dystopic future world that isn't as beautiful as we would like our future worlds to be. You know, they're living in a world without water and they're killing each other over it. Um, that's the version I'm talking about is the one with Sting in it. And um, it's just, it's visually incredible. Again, it, Mad Max, same type of feel, uh, dark. You get an extra point, you, David Lynch. So that's an early June. That's an early David Lynch. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't actually even make that connection. But Mad Max is considered one of those because the the just it's beautiful, even though it's uncomfortable and difficult. And I would not want to live anywhere near that world. It is visually just awesome. yep. fantasy, and but not exactly. not yeah. our. Yeah, not the future that we were told we were going to have. You know, it's difficult and it's very, you know, guerrilla piratey, you know. Like yeah, I mean, like, there's, it's pretty much all desert where they mm -hmm. are. No water, not like limited resources, no government. Everyone's basically, like, it's every man for themselves right. or like right. they, they have a tribe or like they kill each other. They kill people in their own tribe. Right. It's pirates. The existence yep. of pirates who just come in and take what they want. And, you know, they, they bond with each other until they turn on each other. And But basically, they're, they're all nomads. But it's a violent, very cannibalistic, you know, low, lower level. We're supposed to be more sophisticated and, and above all of that. And it just reminds you like, oh my God, what if this is the future? What if this is the direction that we're actually going in? You know, um, it's it's pretty fascinating, but the beauty in that film, the coloring in that film, um, yeah. and the innovation of creating things that did not exist. You know, yeah. Star Trek it, like, on television created things that didn't exist. You know, um, he would, uh, Rod would, they, production designer would show him a shrub and or a plant and they say, oh, this is the plant. And they're like, that's not the plant. Took the plant, pulled it out of its roots, out of the dirt, turned it upside down. He said, that's the plant. All right. Yeah. So it's that, you know, that just looking at things the way we're, we don't know how to look at them. Like it's a new visual or a new definition of something. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. wonder how you even do like, like the production design for Mad Max The Road Warrior, since it's basically like a just a desert, basically. It is just a desert, but it, except there are these playthings and structures and 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 machines that are that they've come out of machines. And so it is, you know, but it might be set in an old oil refinery. It is a dystopic world of you know what's on the surface is just people have abandoned. They're no longer safe to live in, so there it's the ruins. Um, and, and so you have that. There was a, the walkers, I think it is. Did you, have you ever heard of that? I think it's called the walker. Oh no. The stalker 1979. They wanted a chemical, um, installation that had been blown out. And that's where the topic of where they filmed it. Well, they did. 
and it's beautiful and it won great awards. It also killed, ultimately caused the death of the director, the production designer, and several of the actors because they were shooting legit in something that probably like a Chernobyl had half lives. And they put themselves to get the shot, to get that film, they put themselves exposed to the chemical radiation, silent, um, that, that existed. But it it's brilliantly done and it has great, the product everyone says is, you know, was it worth it? No, but it is this brilliant product, but that's taking realism too far. Robert, what do you like foresee like with the future production design of the film? Um, it's going into a bunch of different directions, but a lot of it is so engineered and mechanically produced. So that's changing the dynamics a lot, but they don't really have to, um, they can do a lot of it out of the studio. They can do it post CGI, you know, our, our big phrase, I will fix it in post is getting to the point where like, nobody's gonna have to leave anywhere. We're gonna do it all in post. So that scares me a little bit because I like the tactile part of it. Um, but it is amazing that we're capable and able to do that when you have things that are like Avatar and it's going in all those different categories, all in one film. You know, they've segued all of those tools. So that that is the thing that concerns me. But I do think that the direction is better because producers and more people are getting into film that have a voice. They may not do a whole career out of it, but they are emotionally attached and they sense. So they're making their own movies on their own handheld camera or whatever they're doing, but they um, they have a sense of the feel, I think greater than a director or earlier products where they just barked something, but didn't know how to realize it. So that part I think is, is the plus. Everyone's learning to do everything. So I think it's gonna breed us a, a lot of product that's really incredible. Yeah. Well, Robert, thanks for stopping by today to talk about the beauty of production design and film. Tune in next time where I interview Ed Scully about movies from the golden age of Hollywood. Thank you guys for tuning in to listen. Don't forget to like and subscribe.